Okay, now that we have a basic understanding of fatigue theory, let's take a look at how it's addressed in the AASHTO specification. AASHTO provisions for fatigue and fracture are found together in section 6.6 .6 of the specification. Section 6.6.1 covers load-induced and distortion-induced fatigue, while section 6.6.2 covers brittle fracture. The former is a fracture that occurs as a result of repeated cycles of loading or deformations, whereas the latter is a sudden fracture that occurs in the absence of repeated loading, sometimes under relatively low levels of stress. This segment covers load-induced fatigue primarily, but closes with a couple of slides about distortion-induced fatigue. The idea of brittle fracture is covered separately. The design criteria that needs to be satisfied when checking a detail for load-induced fatigue is shown here. On the left is a demand, delta little f, and on the right is a capacity, delta big F sub n. Gamma is a load factor, which comes from one of the two load combinations that we'll discuss in a bit, and the resistance factor for, fati for fatigue is taken as 1.0. The fatigue stress range is determined by performing an analysis of the structure subjected to the Ashto fatigue truck, which is shown here. The fatigue truck is the same as the truck component of the HL93 loading, except that the axle spacing on the trailer is fixed at 30 feet. Additionally, when a fatigue analysis is performed, an impact factor of 0.15, 1.15, is used instead of the typical value of 1.33. The distribution factors that are used are based on one lane loaded, multiple presence factors are not used, and the load modifiers are taken as 1.0. These assumptions are based on the idea that the cyclic stress range in a fatigue detail occurs as a result of the passage of a single truck in the lane directly above the detail. There are two load combinations that are used for fatigue. The first is used to make an infinite life fatigue check of a fatigue detail, and the second is used to make a finite life check of that detail. In general, the stress range due to the passage of a fatigue truck is designed to be approximately one half of the stress range resulting from the most heavily loaded vehicle expected to cross a bridge during the design life of the structure. The load factors for fatigue changed in the eighth edition of the AASHTO specification. The basis for this change is a 2016 Transportation Research Board project that studied weigh in motion data of trucks that was collected from sites around the U.S. That study led to a change in the load factors used for the, for the two fatigue load combinations. As a side note, I didn't notice this change until I prepared this material over spring break. So I know that many of you use the old load factors in your design project, and that's just fine to leave them as is. Just bear in mind when you are start working on a real world project that the load factors have changed by a bit. The basis for the two different fatigue load combinations comes from NCHRP Report 721, which was published in 2012. Prior to that, there was just a single fatigue load combination. NCHRP is a National Cooperative Highway Research Program, and since the SN curves that form the basis of the AASHTO fatigue provisions represent a 50% chance of survival for any given detail, Report 721 recommends making an infinite life check at the maximum stress range that is expected, as opposed to the effective stress range. For AASHTO purposes, the maximum stress range is taken as approximately twice the effective stress range. Specifically, it's taken as the ratio of the load factors for the fatigue one and the fatigue two load combinations. The fatigue strength that is needed in our design criteria on slide 22 is determined as is shown here. If the fatigue check is being made for infinite life with a fatigue one combination, then the fatigue strength delta capital F sub N is simply the fatigue limit delta F sub TH or the fatigue threshold. In other words, um, that's the threshold below which the detail will survive theoretically forever. This corresponds to the horizontal portion of the SN curve at the lower right part of the chart. On the other hand, if the fatigue check is being made for finite life with fatigue combination two, then the fatigue strength delta F sub N is taken as A over N to the one third power. This corresponds to the slope portion of the SN curve. When A over N to the one third power is plotted on log, log paper, then it appears as a straight line. 
and is the number of stress cycles expected at the detail. Note that the ODOT bridge design manual requires that bridges be de designed for infinite fatigue life. The values of A and delta F sub TH are constants determined based on the particular detail being evaluated, and they are looked up in tables based on the detail category that is assigned to the detail. First, let's talk about capital N, the number of stress cycles expected at the fatigue detail. N is a function of several variables. First, the bridge is designed for 75 years of design life, and there are approximately 365 days in each year. Next, you multiply by the average daily truck traffic that is expected in a single lane on the bridge. Then finally, you multiply by a lowercase n, the number of stress cycles expected per each truck passage. In the absence of better information, the single lane average daily truck traffic can be estimated using the truck fraction P shown here. If there is only one lane available to trucks in a given direction, then all of the trucks must travel in that lane. If there are two lanes available in a given direction, then it is assumed that 85% of the trucks use one lane and 15% use the other. If there are three lanes in a given direction, then it's assumed that 80% of the trucks use one lane. Keep directionality in mind, however. If there is one lane in each direction, then there are a thousand trucks crossing the bridge per day, then it might be fair to assume that half of them cross in each direction. However, there are cases where that isn't necessarily true. Uh, take, for example, the Hone Bridge. Uh, you could search that on YouTube, and there's an interesting video about a failure of this bridge where a salt pile is located at one end of the structure. So DOT trucks would come to the salt pile empty, crossing the bridge in one direction, and not, not really inducing much of a fatigue load in that case. But then they would load up with salt and cross back across the bridge in the other direction, inducing a a fatigue load. And in that case, the uh, directionality wasn't exactly what the engineers thought. Um, basically, all the trucks crossed in one direction when it came to consideration. Of For some bridges, average daily truck traffic data may not be available, and you may have to use average daily traffic data instead. In those cases, the average daily truck traffic can be estimated by multiplying the truck fraction from the table on this slide by the average daily traffic for the bridge. On a rural interstate, it's assumed that 20% of the traffic on the bridge is truck traffic, and on an urban secondary road, it's assumed that 10% of the traffic on the bridge is truck traffic. Okay, to summarize, we have the average daily traffic, the ADT, that's a total count of all vehicles on a bridge in a day. We have the average daily truck traffic, which is a count of all the trucks on a bridge in a day. And then we have the single lane average daily truck traffic, the ADTTSL, which is a count of all the trucks in a single lane on the bridge in one day. The last parameter to consider is the lowercase n, which is the number of stress cycles per truck passage. Consider a truck passing over a relatively large bridge and let's look at the mid-span bending stress, sigma, as the truck crosses. As the truck crosses, crosses the bridge, a fatigue detail at mid-span would experience one stress cycle. Now consider a truck passing over a relatively small bridge. As the truck crosses this smaller bridge, the fatigue detail at mid-span would experience two or possibly three stress cycles because the span length of the truck I'm sorry, the span length of the bridge is actually short relative to the axle spacing of the truck. So this table uh, was presented in previous editions of the AASHTO specification. Uh, it was in the AASHTO specification up through the seventh edition and actually distinguished what the lowercase n should be based on the span length of the structure. However, this table was simplified in the eighth edition of the specification. So now you don't have to distinguish based on the span length of the structure, and instead you just look at the type of detail that you're working with and determine the number of stress cycles per truck passage based on that. Note that details that are located within the span, one-tenth of the span length are considered to be near the support for the definitions of this, this value. Okay, now we're going to take a look at the SN curves again from the AASHTO specification. Each of the curves represents a different fatigue category that's stipulated in the specification, categories A through E prime. 
Suppose that we have a category A fatigue detail and look at the threshold stress of 24 KSI. That would correspond to a fatigue life of roughly 19 million cycles shown here. Mathematically, we would take the threshold stress of 24 KSI and divide by the ratio of 1.75 to 0 0.80 to get 10.97 KSI. Then we would divide 250 times 10 to the eighth KSI cubed by that value to get 19 million cycles. Then if we divide by 365 days a year and then divide by 75 years for the bridge life, you can see that when lowercase n equals one, a single lane ADTT greater than 692 trucks per day will be governed by the infinite life check. These values for different fatigue categories have been tabulated for you in the specification. This is handy for design. If you know that your bridge is going to see 1200 trucks per day in a single lane and you're evaluating a category C detail, for example, then you would evaluate that detail for finite life using the fatigue two combination. On the other hand, if you know that the bridge is going to see 1200 trucks per day in a single lane and you're evaluating a category B detail, then you would evaluate that detail for infinite life using the fatigue one combination. When computing the stress range at a given detail in a composite bridge, you use the short-term composite section properties so long as the shear studs are provided over the entire length of the bridge. Residual stresses aren't considered when we evaluate the uh, details for fatigue. Finally, the provision shown here points out that fatigue needs to be considered only when a detail is in tension. If a detail is in compression and never sees any tension, then it doesn't need to be checked for fatigue. Finally, there are several pages of, of detail categories presented in the specification. And when you're considering fatigue of a bridge, you would look at the details on your structure, maybe the uh, splices where the flange plates change thickness or width, or maybe you have a field splice where you have a bolted connection. Maybe it's just the locations where the cross frames frame into the, into the main members. As the engineer, you would look at those details and find similar details in the catalog that's provided in the specification. This slide just shows the first three of several different uh, uh, detail categories. And this slide shows three more. There are several pages in the specification, and what I'll do is I'll post those as a PDF along with the link to this presentation so you have access to them. Okay, we're going to shift our attention at this point to distortion-induced fatigue. Distortion-induced fatigue is a type of fatigue due to secondary stresses that are not normally calculated in the typical design of a bridge. The Ashto commentary says that when proper detailing practices are not followed, fatigue cracking has been found to occur due to strains not normally computed in the design process. This type of fatigue cracking is called distortion-induced fatigue. This often occurs in the web near a flange at a welded connection plate for a cross frame where a rigid load path has not been provided. These rigid load paths are required to preclude the development of secondary stresses that could induce fatigue crack growth. Looking at a cross section of a girder near a cross frame, the gap region adjacent to the flange is one of the common places where this distortion induced fatigue cracking occurs, particularly when the connection plate or stiffener isn't welded to both flanges. Okay, here is a second area where we zoom in a little bit more. And if you look closely, you could imagine some flexing that might occur in the web if a rigid load path isn't provided. Most engineers wouldn't calculate the stress at this location due to the secondary distortion, and you won't find a detail category for that situation. So it's referred to as distortion-induced fatigue instead of a load-induced fatigue. So why wouldn't the stiffener be welded to the flange? Well, because it creates a load-induced fatigue detail in the flange that might end up controlling. 
So the proper way to handle this type of situation is through proper detailing of the connections. In general, the connection plates or stiffeners should be welded or bolted to both flanges of the beam or girder if it's possible. Okay, this is the end of our discussion of fatigue. At this point, you could take a look at some examples that are posted along with this presentation and possibly review the fatigue checks that are part of the girder bridge case studies. Thanks.